Hey everybody. It says chapter 10, but we're doing chapter 10 second because for some reason the textbook doesn't move in chronological order. And I feel like it's logical to start with the oldest media and move forward to the more current forms. So we're starting with books. So don't be confused, even though we're still at the beginning of the semester, we're doing chapter 10 today and it's all about books. Okay. So here we go. This is something that your book mentions about books. It's very meta. Our oldest mass medium is still our most influential and our most diverse. And I want you to think about that for a minute. What is it about books that are still so influential? And how are they still so diverse? They've been around forever. And yet those of us who spend 12 hours a day with electronic mass media still enjoy books. So one thing that we're going to start each chapter with is how is this medium different from all the others? In what ways do we consume this medium differently than others? And how has this medium changed throughout the years? So for books, for example, we typically do that independently. That's a, it's an activity we do alone. And usually, you know, if we go to movies, we typically go in a group, right? So we consume books individually. It's a very personal experience. And if you think about how diverse books are, they're certainly more diverse than movies. Uh, you know, movies are mainly just a superhero and franchise films and recycled ideas. We'll get to that. We'll get to that in a couple weeks. But if you go to a bookstore, you could find a book on almost anything. And that's what your book is talking about, that, that books are still around, they're still influential, and they're still very diverse. Okay, so we want to start with paper. It all starts with paper, right? And the very first paper that was used to make books is actually called papyrus. And it was made with reeds from the Nile River, and it was Egyptian. And it was really, really expensive to get because think if you're in Europe and you want paper, you've got to pay for it to come from Egypt. And it didn't last very long. And typically you rolled it into scrolls. So if you hear things about like the Dead Sea Scrolls or scrolls discovered in the Middle East, typically it's papyrus. Now the improvement was parchment. Parchment was treated animal skin and it was stronger, smoother, lasted longer, and it was cheaper because you could just, you know, get animals from anywhere. One of the first recorded books is uh, called a codex. What it is essentially is just layers of parchment sewn together and then pieces of wood on either side. This is an image from one of the codices, which is singular for codex. And I love it because it reminds me of where the wild things are. Doesn't it look like a wild thing? I think it does. I think it does. Uh, so the Middle Ages was called like the era of manuscripts because books were copied usually by scribes or monks. In fact, your book refers to them as the chief caretakers of recorded history. They did this by hand and they didn't just write out the books. They made them illuminated manuscripts. So, and you've seen pictures, I'm going to show you in just a second. They're the really elaborate drawings with um, the writing and the borders and the big letters with gems. These monks or scribes were the first to put spaces between words. They were the first to use capital letters. So think about how much more difficult it would be to read a book without spaces between words and without capital letters. So we have them to thank for that. So this is like what um, some illuminated manuscripts might look like. Okay. And of course I'm adding gifts because I love gifts. So you see like the really big letter D there on the left, how elaborate these were. And can you imagine how long it took for one scribe or monk to copy just, just one page of this, not, you know, much less an entire book. So the oldest printed book still in existence is called the uh, Chinese Diamond Sutra. And what the Chinese did was use block printing. So think about those blocks you had when you were little that had A, B, and C on them, right? Think about dipping those in ink and then stamping those on paper. And then you can take the next letter, dip it in ink and stamp it. So it's not necessarily faster, but it's easier on the hand. Okay. So they were using block printing 
But the real magic happened with Gutenberg's printing press. And if you've taken any history class, you know that there really hasn't been anything since the printing press that changed society as much. Maybe the internet, well, time will tell. But what Gutenberg did was develop a machine that's a lot like block printing, but it prints all the blocks at the same time. So you lay out the blocks in this tray, okay? You slather the blocks with ink. Then you put a piece of paper down and then you pull a press down on top of the blocks. And then you have a printed sheet of paper, an entire sheet all at once. And then you know what you get to do again? The same thing. So you can print up sheet after sheet after sheet. This was significant because up to this point, people didn't really read. They didn't have to. I mean, there weren't books around anyway. And the you know feudal lords and the priests and bishops were the only ones that knew how to read. And they were the ones who were telling everybody what the world was like. So for the first time, now that books were being printed and they were reasonably inexpensive compared to those illuminated manuscripts, everybody could read. I mean, the, the literacy rate didn't go up until later, but we'll get, to, <laughs> we'll get to that. The point is, is that knowledge was now portable and it wasn't confined to just the leaders of the society at that point. So it was huge. Um, the first colonial book, Book of Psalms, which is what I used to call it, 1640. Uh, of course, it was a religious book. The Stamp Act is something pretty significant in your book, and here's why. The British passed the Stamp Act in 1765. What they said is that if you're going to print anything, hey, colonists, if you're going to print anything, you got to print it on the special paper that has the stamp on it. And you know what? If the government is selling you paper, do you think it's cheaper or more expensive than regular paper? Mm, more expensive. So think of it as... Like if you had to pay a tax every time you posted something on Instagram, anytime you put up a TikTok, anytime you tweeted something out, anytime you sent a text, you had to pay the government a tax. No wonder they got so mad at the Stamp Act. And so this kind of helped propel the revolution. So the role that paper and printing has played in our history is significant. So you get to the mid 1800s, you got dime novels, of course they cost a dime. And this is where the term Pulp Fiction comes from. It doesn't come from the Samuel Jackson, John Travolta, Quentin Tarantino movie. No. It comes from um, how pulpy the paper was. It was printed on really cheap, pulpy paper. Pulp fiction. Okay. Now, your book mentions books as agents of social change, meaning that books throughout history have played a role in changing our culture. And of course, one of the obvious examples is Uncle Tom's Cabin um, by Harriet Beecher Stowe. This was one of the first times that people in the North actually were told what slavery was actually like in the South. And of course, you know, many historians claim that this book helped um, galvanize the North against slavery and uh, during World War or <laughs> during um, the Civil War. Your book also has a list of banned books. Now, what does it take to get a book banned? It only takes one crazy parent at a PTA meeting. That's all it takes. And this doesn't mean that they've been banned by the government. Remember, the government can't do that because of the First Amendment. This just means that various libraries or school districts somewhere have banned these books or banned at least one of these books. So look through these. I imagine if you've made it through a high school in America, you have read at least one of these. And what is it that you think got them banned? Interesting to think about, isn't it? And so when we talked at the beginning of this about how books are influential and diverse, this is what we're talking about. Because books are so powerful that crazy parents will go to a PTA meeting and demand that they be removed from a school library. That's power. So now we're going to talk about types of books. And you know what? Everybody knows like this is a hardcover book, right? It's hardcover. Here's the thing. Um, I used to work in the book industry, and so this is how I know this stuff. This book is pretty old. Um, it retailed for $29. So that means that the bookstore where this book was purchased paid 50% of that to the publisher. So they paid $14.50. So they're making 100% profit every time they sell one of these books at full price. Okay, so hardcovers are worth a lot of money if you're in a bookstore. Now, 
trade paperback is something like this, okay? So it's not the size of a mass market. It's bigger, usually a little bit wider and a little bit taller, and it's printed on nicer paper than a mass market book. Trade paperbacks have a, a reputation of being a little more highbrow than mass market books. Now, this is a mass market book, meaning you can buy it anywhere. You can get them at grocery stores, airports. Um, this is a pretty hefty one because it's Stephen King and it's old. Um, this was $9. So this would have, you know, the store where this was purchased would have paid $4.50 for this and then sold it for nine. So there's a pretty good, what's the word, markup? Um, oh, what is the word? There's, there's a pretty good, um, yeah, profit for books. But there's a trick. Okay, so say for example that I have a bookstore. I buy 100 copies of this Stephen King book and I only sell 50. In most retail establishments, I would drop the price until it sells, right? Well, the book industry is different. I can return this. I can return books to the publisher that I don't sell. Now, this book probably cost the publisher a dollar to make. I'm just guessing, but it's heavy. It would cost more than a dollar to ship this back to the publisher. So what booksellers do is rip off the front cover of a mass market book so that it looks like this, okay? This is my copy of Prayer for Own Meaning. I just love it, okay. You send the covers back to the publisher and say, we did not sell this book. Please give us return credit for this book. And then you throw this book in the dumpster behind the warehouse. And then employees like me go dumpster diving after work <laughs> and pull great books out. You're hearing all my secrets. So the book industry is different because you can return things to the publisher. But if you return paperbacks, mass market paperbacks, you want to make sure that the cover's taken off. All right. Um, also, you know how I mentioned that these trade paperbacks are a little more highbrow? Uh, J.K. Rowling made a deal with Simon & Schuster that she never ever wanted Harry Potter to be sold in mass market. She only wanted the paperback version to be trade paperback and she got her wish. Of course she did. If I was Simon & Schuster, I'd do whatever she asked me to. So let's talk about instant books. Um, here's a book about Meghan Markle that came out last spring when they got married. and. Instant books can happen as quickly as six days. So let me give you an example. Um, this one was published in April and you know we were shut down in March. This one doesn't come out until uh, August 25th of this year, but John Lewis recently died, I think he died two weeks ago. So instant books are a great cash cow if you're a bookstore because you can capitalize on news coverage of a certain event. Right, you want to sell the books while the interest is still there. But the risk, though, is that if you order too many, you're going to be stuck with a lot of instant books, but and then you can send them back. Okay. Movie tie ins are super, super common. Here's the original version of Crazy Rich Asians, but when a movie is made of it, you have to re release the book with the movie poster version. And this um, encourages a new audience and it lets the audience know that there's a movie that goes with the book. Okay, and I only bring this up because um, these are my favorite, favorite movies. And the original, of course, is on the left. Then when the movie comes out, you have to include scenes from the movie to draw the people in. So movie tie-ins are pretty common. In fact, um, some super savvy marketers, like with um, the Twilight series, they actually had different versions of the movie tie-ins for people who were collecting various versions of Edward or whoever. Okay, so reference books, you know, you, you know the category, encyclopedias, dictionaries, atlases, of course, sales of all of these are declining because everything is right on here. We don't need these expensive heavy books anymore. In fact, this is the Encyclopedia Britannica forever. It was like the um, epitome of encyclopedias and it actually quit publishing on paper a few years ago because no one was buying them. Why would they? Right? Everything is digital now. So how do you get a book published? Well, I'm going to tell you a funny story um, about how my first book got published. So you need to know a couple people. The first person is an acquisition editor. What they do is read manuscripts that are sent to them by 
aspiring authors. So if you love to read and you really know what makes a book good, you would make a fantastic acquisition editor for a publishing company. So if you read a manuscript that you think is really, really good, you can offer that author a contract. And then you also have to worry about subsidiary rights. Now what that means is that you're selling the rights to use that book's material in other media like movies, um, oh gosh, board games, video games, you name it. I mean, you think of everything that, that you can get with uh, Harry Potter, Twilight, or Game of Thrones, right? So subsidiaries, let's talk about Game of Thrones. Here's the original book, but then there's t-shirts, pillows, pops, Monopoly, and a lot of this is based on the HBO series, right? But still, they would have had to negotiate the subsidiary rights for HBO to buy that story. So if you end up getting your book published, make sure that you look for subsidiary rights in case your book takes off and people want to make a theme park out of it. So can you get an advance if you publish a book? Yeah, but it's usually only famous people. <laughs> Like really famous people get advances like the um, Barack and Michelle Obama have like a 60 million dollar advance for their book. It sounds amazing, but if somebody gave me the money before I would write the book, I would lose all of my motivation to finish the book. So after you have a book contract, you get a developmental editor. And what that person does is provide feedback and suggestions. It's kind of like grading a paper. They look for continuity. They um, look for gaps in the story. Then a copy editor makes sure that the pages match, that, um, that paragraphs aren't separated at the end of page after page after page. And you also want to have a design manager to cover how the books look. So I'm going to tell you a story. Um, I wrote a book a couple of years ago, and I thought I thought that I was like a decent writer, right? I'm old, teach college. Oh no! When I got the first chapter back from my editor, this is what it looked like. Yeah, Erin was my developmental editor. And she had such a skill because she took what I had written and just made it better. I mean, it still sounded like me, but it sounded like a much smarter version of me. I wish Erin could follow me around all day. She also taught me how to look at her criticisms or suggestions without all the red text because it's, it's humiliating, right? Then my design editor was a woman named Genesis. Now I never met Erin in person. I never met Genesis in person. This was all done online. And I told the publisher, look, you guys are the ones that sell books. I don't know what I want my cover to look like. I don't know, I've never done this before. And they said, the cover has to represent the writer. It has to. Okay, so they sent me something called a book cover brief. They wanted me to know whether the title was the most important, the subtitle or the author's name. Now, if my name was Stephen King, that would be the biggest part of the cover, but nobody knows who I am, so it's tiny at the bottom. Uh, then I also got to pick the size of the book, okay? And what they told me was go to Amazon and send us 20 photos of book covers that you like, okay? So I sent them these images. So by looking at these images, you kind of get an idea, right, of what aesthetics I like. And I was also supposed to send them designs that I did not like, okay? Nothing against the dog and cat down there. It's just not my style, okay? So Genesis was able to look at what I liked and what I didn't like and come up with this cover for my book. And I thought it was amazing. that she I never even spoke to her, but she could tell. So if you have any interest in books or graphic design, perhaps a design editor for a publishing company is a great job for you because you could talk to someone and kind of get an idea of what their book is about and what they want the cover to look like. They also arrange the start of each chapter of my book to make it uniform. And if you read any Harry Potter books, you know that they did the exact same thing, that the same illustrator did a little uh, beginning, cart not cartoon, but an illustration before every chapter. It helps with continuity. It helps with the design and the look of the book. Okay, so those are design editors. And speaking of design, Harry even had his own alphabet designed. And if you notice, 
the spine, you know, all of those books are very jewel-toned, kind of argyle. They have the same look. And that's an excellent, excellent design editor, Simon & Schuster, that did that. So let's talk about her for a minute. Um, the first 12 publishing houses rejected it. I'm sure all 12 of them regret that very, very much. But your book claims that her books, that Harry Potter, banished illiteracy, and that's a term that you need to know. Illiteracy is the inability to read. A literacy is the ability to read, but the no desire to read. And with the Harry Potter books, a lot of kids were reading books that had never read books before. And that's why your book claims that she helped ban A literacy. The best bestseller list, of course, is the New York Times. That's the classic, that's the standard. They used to have just a very basic hardcover fiction. Uh, paperback fiction, hardcover nonfiction, paperback nonfiction. They've since expanded it into various categories like self-help, cooking books, uh, business books, fiction, nonfiction, that sort of thing. Uh, but think of the changes that the book industry has have, have gone through just in the last 20 years. Most of us now buy books online. Most of us now read books on a screen. Very few independent booksellers are still left. In fact, remember um, Barnes & Noble, no, it was Borders, Borders that went out of business. So it's, it's a very changing environment, but I think it's comforting to know that books will always be around. I mean, I, there's just nothing like the smell and the feel of a real book, right? So that's chapter 10, and this is the second, uh, second unit for Media Foundations, and I hope you, um, learned a little bit about books. Woo! All right. See you next time.